Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, and, and, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, yesterday afternoon at around 5, 5.15, uh, Mark over here uh, came by the house where I'm staying, the Harbor House. I highly recommend it. I'm not sure if it's accessible to you all or not. Uh, maybe after you finish school, he came by with four other students, and uh, uh, they walked me to Professor Ewart and Coolidge's home for dinner. And Mark, I don't know if you remember this, but um, Amanda asked me the question as we were walking along the sidewalk, how does it feel to be back at Wheaton, your school, after many years? And I kind of paused, and she said, does it feel strange? I said, yeah, kind of strange. Uh, and and I, don't, I can't remember if I said this or not, but I'm also a little, I was also a little bit scared about coming back, you know, to my home school and, you know, talking in chapel and so forth. But you and you have made me feel so welcome, so, so thank you so much. Uh, and I'm wondering if, Sam, do you mind representing the guys here? You, are you okay with that? You mind if I give you a hug? It's not very often that Wheaton is going to see two Asian guys hug. <laughs> Love you, brother. All right. You saw it here at chapel. Claire, do you mind standing up and, yeah, I'm going to give you a hug for all my sisters here, so, all right. I normally don't have the courage to do that kind of thing, but some guy in the bathroom said, hey, can I give you a hug? <laughs> <laughs> now, what was I supposed to talk about today? <laughs> if you come back to Wheaton after you graduate, I hope that you feel the same welcome that I have felt from you. I really do. It's been such a gift. You know, years ago, uh, Harvard University did this unusual long-range study where they, they actually tracked 268 students. They were men at the time. It was like Radcliffe was for the women, Harvard was for the men. 268 men who had graduated in the late 1930s. Uh, John Kennedy was in that class. They've tracked these guys for more than 70 years across their experiences of war and career, marriage, divorce, parenting, and grandparenting, and they wanted to study their lives to see what contributed most to their well-being and happiness. And here is the surprising finding of the study. When these men elite, ambitious guys, now in their 90s, look back over their life, they say that the thing that brought them most satisfaction was not their career success, nor their celebrated accomplishments, but their families and their friendships. Uh, George Valiant, who has led the study for more than 40 years now, was asked, what have you learned from the study of these men? Valiant's response, quote, the only thing that really matters in your life is your relationships. Not our grades, not our career or financial success, but our relationships. And God made us for relationships. I mean, you go back to, to the book of Genesis, to the very beginning. We, we read about how God created the world, how God created the land and the seas, the, the plants and the trees, the, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the mammals, and then a human being. And God steps back and says of his creation, it is good. It is very good. But then God says something astonishing. He says that something in his creation is not good. God says it is not good that man is alone. That's just stunning because when you think about it, Adam had an ideal environment in Eden. He has an intimate relationship with God that has not been marred by sin. He lives in a pristine paradise. He has fulfilling work that engages his mind and his body as a zoologist and as a farmer. He has a limitless supply of delectable food. But God says of Adam, it is not good that you are alone. And here's the thing. 
you, you too can have a relationship with God, live in a place of stunning beauty. I hope some of you move to Vancouver. It's quite beautiful when the sun is out. <laughs> but it rains a lot there too. You can have a fulfilling career, an endless supply of delicious food. You can, in effect, recreate Eden, but if you don't have a relationship, and I don't necessarily mean a romantic relationship, but a friendship that is close and loving, you will find that something is missing in your life because God made us for relationships. God is one, but God is also Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is community. At the center of the universe is a relationship. And you were made in the image of God. You were made for relationship. And so the more you are in friendship, the more you are like God. Friendships give us the greatest joys and satisfactions of life, but friendships also comprise an important part of our trellis, our rhythm or rule of life that supports our friendship with God. Yes, Bible study and prayer are important, but spiritual friendship can be just as important, and for some people in certain seasons of their life, even more important. So what's the difference between a Facebook friend and a real friend? Talk to me more about that later. It sounds like some of you have some ideas. <laughs> a real friend is someone who really commits, a friend commits, a friend lifts us up, and a friend lets us in. And in the scriptures, we have a beautiful, moving example of a true friendship in the friendship of Jonathan and David. Uh, for all the external factors in their life, it's amazing that they ever become friends because they're both young, attractive, athletic leaders. They're both considered the heir apparent to King Saul, Jonathan's father. They should have been rivals, but they become friends. They commit to each other. They lift each other up, and they let each other in. A friend commits. We see this in the example of Jonathan and David's friendship. In 1 Samuel 18, we get a window into their commitment to each other. We read, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Let's just take a moment to pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would become one in spirit with you, and out of our friendship with you, we would know the gift of real friendship with one another. And it's in your name we pray, amen. When Jonathan takes off his robe, gives it to David along with his tunic, his sword, and his belt. Jonathan is symbolically saying, I am relinquishing my birthright to the throne to you. He commits, he sacrifices. And then David in turn responds by saying, Jonathan, I will always show kindness to you and to your family. David and Jonathan become friends because they are willing to commit. Friends commit. Jacob is a friend of mine who attended Wheaton. Uh, he transferred in, and then he transferred out. And he describes how his friendship with Jeremy, a mutual friend of ours, was formed. Uh, Jacob has given me permission to share this story of his. Uh, Jeremy says, in my freshman year, this was at another school on the East Coast, I met Jeremy on a rugged path through campus where we both happened to stop at the same time to investigate an unusual gnarled tree. In short order, our acquaintance grew from horticultural interest to a deep friendship. But our paths later diverged when I pursued a carefree bohemian lifestyle while Jeremy maintained his pursuit of Christ. Years later, when I spun into crisis 
after a friend of mine had committed suicide. I reached out to Jeremy. I met regularly with him through the aftermath of my loss, and he simply listened, giving me space to grieve. After some time, Jeremy invited me to climb a perilous precipice near campus, and on the narrow platform at the top, Jeremy offered me a lifetime of friendship saying this, if you ever need a place to stay, you can stay with me. If you ever need money or a phone to borrow, <laughs> you have my bank account and my cell phone number. You really want to call this guy, don't you? <laughs> I'll give you his number later. Uh, right. If you ever need time, my time is yours. And Jacob said, I was stunned. I was stunned. In truth, I felt so unworthy of this level of friendship that I initially declined this gift. Later, I rescinded and accepted the offer. Reflecting later on 20 years of brotherhood that still includes regular times of meeting, I look back on that commitment as the first tangible sign of unconditional love that I had experienced in many years. It was the beam of light breaking into my despair of loss that ultimately led me to pursue the source of that light and love in God. Real friends, true friends, commit to each other. And real friends lift each other up. You know, when, when David was discouraged and anxious because he, he knew that King Saul was chasing him down with his army to assassinate him. Jonathan, risking his life, goes into the wilderness, seeks David out, and helps David find strength in God. It's what a real friend does. On Wednesday, I mentioned my, my longtime friend, Leighton Ford, a Wheaton grad, an older Presbyterian minister. And... Uh, you know, I first spent time with Leighton when I was a student in Boston, a graduate student in Boston at a seminary. And Leighton had asked me to drive him west across the state of Massachusetts to the home of one of his board members. And I remember picking Leighton up at Logan Airport at around 10.30 at night. And uh, we're driving onto the interstate. And I turn to Leighton and I say, Leighton, it's, it's kind of late. You've had a long day of travel. Uh, you're very welcome to recline your seat and sleep if you want. And Leighton said, I don't think I'll sleep, but I will recline my chair a little bit. And so he crossed his long legs, reclined the seat. He looked at me and said, now tell me your life story. <laughs> and then I started talking and he fell asleep. <laughs> uh, not really. And for the last 20 years, not continuously, obviously, but Leighton has been listening to my life story and I hope that I've been attentive to his life story. It's what friends do. You know, when I first arrived at 10th Church, as I was telling some folks at breakfast this morning, back in 1996, I was really intimidated at what lay ahead of me. I had gone through a painful romantic breakup at the time, and uh, I'm facing this community that has gone from over 1,000 people in the 1950s to like 100 and something. The church has cycled through 20 ministers in 20 years. And during my first week, I'm in my office, and, and my secretary walks in, and she says, she comes up to me and says, Ken, if the ship sinks now, everyone's going to blame you because you were the last person at the helm. And she turned on her heels and walked out of the office. I think she was trying to motivate me to work harder. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. <laughs> Guess I don't need to listen to Tony Robbins today. I feel so uplifted. I felt depressed. And right around that time, my friend Leighton Ford, my mentor, happened to be in Vancouver. And we're, we're sitting in my car outside the church. And I am, I am really down and desperate for some encouragement. But I'm too, I feel, I so, sound so pathetic. Leighton, give me some encouragement. I sound like, I sound like such a loser. So I say, Leighton, um, can you give me some counsel? I don't laugh, but I'm kind of laughing inside a little bit because I know what I really want. And Leighton pauses for a moment. And he says, Ken... Remember that God is an artist. He will not lead you to copy anyone else, so seek God for a unique vision for this place. 
Those words just sunk into my heart and lifted my spirit, and they've been with me ever since. When you're in the presence of a real friend, something inside you lifts and something inside you straightens. Because a true friend like Jonathan or David or Ruth or Naomi will commit, but they will also lift you up. And then third, a true friend will let you in. They will let you in. You know, Jonathan and David were both warriors. They were both you know, tough guys, but they were also tender-hearted. And, and David confides very transparently to Jonathan, saying, I'm afraid of your dad. I, I think he's trying to kill me. He's just totally honest. And Jonathan is transparent about his love for David and his affection for him. And friends are just open with one another. You know, when I was in Ireland, I talked about Ireland on Wednesday, I, I learned a, a, a new word, a word that I had never heard before, anamkara. Do you know that, that word? Anam comes from the Gaelic word for soul. And kara, the word friend. And so anamkara is a soul friend a friend on the journey. And originally, an anamkara referred to someone that you confessed your sins to, that you shared your secrets with, but it came to mean someone with whom you shared your innermost self, your true self. You know, last night at dinner at the Ewerts, uh, someone asked me beside me at dinner, you know, what's the most important quality in like a friend, I, and I'm like, I guess I should know this. I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow. <laughs> I kind of drew a blank for a moment. I think it's transparency. You know, you, to be with someone with whom you can shed the half-truths, you can be utterly yourself, someone with whom you can relax at heart and share your, 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 you know, your, your failures and your fears and your secrets and your hopes and your dreams. Friendship is born when two people are vulnerable enough to share their weaknesses. And I said, it's hard for me as a man, as an Asian man, it's, it's, that's hard. But, it, but it, that's the path to real friendship. A number of years ago, before I became a pastor, when I was single, I was on a trip. And it's easier to write about this than to actually talk about it uh, in some ways, but... I'm on a trip, and I, I meet this, this woman that I'm really attracted to. She's working as a, an actress, a model, a model actress. There's just lots of chemistry. I'm kind of wowed and starstruck because I haven't met a person like this before. And I was really tempted to have a fling with her, but she was committed to someone else, and I had my heart set on someone back home. And so I knew that it was wrong. And then one night on this trip, at around midnight or 12.30 in the morning, um, this woman shows up at my hotel lobby, calls up to my room, and she said, Ken, um, you mentioned you wanted to see my modeling portfolio. Well, I brought it to show you. What room are you in? And I'm on the phone, and I'm kind of feeling excited and wondering how this will unfold. But there's part of me that has this bad feeling. That's an original quote from my mom. <laughs> Did your mom ever say, I have a bad feeling about this? So I had a good and bad feeling, an excited feeling, but ambivalent. And we talked for a while. I really wanted to invite her up to see what might unfold. But in the end, we just talked on the phone, and she didn't come up to my room. When I got home, I talked very honestly with a close friend of mine about what had happened. And I said, you know, Steve, it's a real name. There, there's, a, there's a part of me that just wanted to say, what the, you know. And <laughs> we're on the radio, all right? And just, you know. Good, all right. We have a witness in the house, so we got a witness in the house. Right. But I also felt that, no, this would not be the right thing to do. And I wanted to call you to gain perspective because I felt like the air was going out of my room or at least out of my brain at the time. And he, Steve said, 
even if it's like three o'clock in the morning, my time on the East Coast, or four o'clock in the morning, call me anytime if you ever need help. And you know, a, a true friend is someone that you can call at four in the morning, three in the morning for help. And by the way, if you want to learn to channel your powerful, erotic, sexual energies in ways that enable you and others to flourish. Um, there is a chapter somewhere in here, Sex and Sexuality, uh, it's in the book, and um, you can check that out later if you want. But a true friend is someone with whom we can share our failures and our struggles, and I have failed many times. A friend can help us gain perspective so we walk with Christ. And when we fall, and we will fall, a true friend can lift us up and say, get back on your feet with me. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to be Christ to you. So a true friend, a true friend commits to us. A true friend lifts us up. A true friend lets us in. And so where do we move from here if we want to pursue true friendships with some people? perhaps here at Wheaton. What a great opportunity. First of all, pray. You know, some of you have prayed for a romantic relationship, maybe a future spouse if you're single, but have you prayed for a friendship, a spiritual friendship? You know, the scriptures make it clear that many friendships, Jonathan and David, Ruth and Naomi, Jesus and his disciples were ordained by God. Friendship is a gift from God. Pray that you would receive this gift. Second, ask. Sometimes all it takes to begin a friendship is a simple ask. You know, last night uh, at the dinner, um, someone was asking me about my time here at Wheaton, and I shared this story. I said, you know, when I was a, when I was a freshman here, uh, there were very few minority students. You know, thank God for the Shalom community and the, the greater diversity here, right? We got some folks out there from Shalom. All right, God bless you, and may your tribe increase. Okay, I mean, maybe not right away, but uh, maybe down the road. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. All right, we're on the radio. All right, what was I going to say? I'm, I'm, I'm a freshman on Traber 7, and I'm walking down the hall one. Traber 7, all right. Shout out to Traber 7. And my uh, RA comes up to me. My RA is like from Sweden, you know, like in terms of his family, Ashton's sister, just very blonde, like you, except the guy, you know? <laughs> blonde hair, blue eyes, you know? And he comes up to me, and he kind of looks around and says, Ken, can you come to my room for a moment? I said, yeah. And he, he closes the door and says, Ken, um, I know there aren't many minorities on campus. And I'm like, yeah, thank God for affirmative action that I got in, you know? <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> Wouldn't have got in today, you know? And Rob says, uh, I know there aren't many Asians on campus. And I don't know if you would ever consider dating someone who's not Asian, but I would encourage you to date while you're here. You know, back in the day, they dated a little bit more than they do now. I've been talking to some of you. <laughs> a little more traditional back in the day. Uh, and so I took his advice as a freshman, you know, and uh, I overcame my natural shyness, my immense fear of rejection. And from time to time, Ask people out on dates. And here's the thing. You know, dating and friendship are different, obviously, in some ways, but sometimes the difference between a friendship and not a friendship is simply overcoming perhaps our natural shyness, if you're like me, or your fear of rejection, and just asking. You want to get together. If there's a connection, do you want to get together regularly for the semester and see where it leads? Pray, ask, and then be the friend you would want to have. You know what the golden rule of friendship is? Do you know what the golden rule of friendship is? The golden rule of friendship is the golden rule. It's just, it's not, it's just, I came to chapel for that. Come on. <laughs> Give me something I can take notes on. The golden friend, the golden, see, I can't even say it. The golden rule of friendship is to be the friend you want to be. Be unto others what you would want them to be unto you. So pray, ask, be the friend you would want to have yourself. You know, at breakfast this morning, um, I asked someone, what's the best thing about being here at Wheaton? He said, you know, just friendships that I'm forming. I was in line for an omelet, and turned around and, and, and said, how, how, to a, this is a football player behind me, I said, what's it like here at Wheaton? He said, this is a great place to, to build a band of brothers. Band of brothers, or 
Could have been a band of sisters, you know, if I was talking to a sister. Could have been. <laughs> you know, they say that it, you, you never have more friends than when you are in high school, but your friends in college can last your lifetime. And so you may never have the opportunity that you have now to form the treasure of friendships. And I'm here in Wheaton. My home is in Vancouver, but my Wheaton friends from my Wheaton days are with me in prayer. They're not with me physically, but they're with me in prayer, even as I speak now. And do you know what the number one determining factor will be as to whether you will continue to follow Christ when you graduate from Wheaton? Do you know what the number one factor is? It's whether you have friends who share a common faith with you. And so while you're here at Wheaton, with your brand of brothers and band of sisters, commit to one another. Lift each other up. And let each other in. Friendship is a gift from God, and when Jesus, as a young man, realized he only had a thousand days left, he invested that time in a close band of sisters and brothers. When those Harvard men, now in their 90s, look back over their lives, they say the greatest thing in our life, the most satisfying thing, was not our career accomplishment, but our friendships. I believe it was Aristotle who said, if you have to choose between all of your material possessions and your friend, you would choose your friend because your friend is a greater treasure. Remember this in closing, that friendship is a, a gift from God that grows out of our friendship with God. Jesus, on the night that he was crucified or betrayed and then crucified the next day, he gathered with a small group of his closest people. And he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends because everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. And so, friends at Wheaton, use your trellis Find a life-giving rhythm or rule that supports your friendship with Jesus, the ultimate friend. And out of your friendship with Jesus, offer the priceless gift of friendship with each other here at Wheaton. God bless you. God bless you.